All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, I guess potentially good evening for those of our friends who are joining um, from Europe and Israel. My name is Jenny Cammy, and I am the director of The Hive, which is Leech Tag Common Center for Collaboration, Connection, and Creativity. For those who are possibly joining us for the first time, um, we're really excited that even in this virtual space, The Hive is able to go full steam ahead um, pursuing our mission. I think today is such a beautiful example of that, connecting people really from around the world with such a phenomenal speaker um, who is on the other side of the globe from us, but in this format, it feels like you're right here in our living room. So we're thrilled to have everyone. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions for the panel, for Charlene and for Dr. Goodman, feel free to put it in the chat. Although you won't be able to see it as participants, I can assure you all of those questions are gonna will go to them um, and hopefully they'll be able to get to them at some point during the session. You can also feel free if you're having any issues, chat me directly. So without further ado, we have jam-packed uh, content today. I wanna turn it over to Leech Tag Foundation Executive Vice President, Charlene Seidel. Um, to introduce our incredible speaker today. Thanks so much, Jenny. So it is really great to welcome everybody on the Zoom. These Zooms have been interesting the last few months because um, I'm somebody that really draws kind of energy from the people that I'm speaking to. So I always try to look at the um, at the list as you know, right before and when people are coming in and kind of visualize all your faces who I know in the audience and also you know, kind of think about all of you kind of joining us here in this virtual room, which which we're really happy to welcome you in and looking forward to the day we can do it in person as well. Um, so I couldn't be more excited to be welcoming our guest, um, Micha, Dr. Micha Goodman. We're so happy to have you here today. And thank you so much for agreeing to do this. It's the evening of what I'm sure was a jam-packed day um, in Israel, uh, where you are. And um, we really, really appreciate your time and your generosity and sharing your wisdom with us. So we've been really privileged to know you, Micha, at least tag and learn from you for several years now. We're really honored to support Beit Prat, which is the institution that you founded that is just building a uh, new generation of um, a new mainstream Israeli society of complex thinkers and um, that manifests in a number of ways. And one of the ways that it manifests for us is that many of your graduates are the activists and social entrepreneurs on the ground in Jerusalem who are really working from the ground up to, to renew that city and make it um, a vibrant, diverse city. So I'm sure you'll talk more about Beit Prat, um, but we really are honored to support you. Um, your, your fresh thinking has always impressed us. Your belief in doing your utmost to equip the new generation to combat the most serious challenges of the day and also make room for them to do so. It just seems like what a remedy for what the world needs right now in so many ways. Um, in a minute, I'll read your more formal bio, but but in thinking about it, you're truly somebody who defies easy categories. I'll just name a few labels. Best-selling author, you've been a radio star, world-renowned scholar, philosopher, influencer. I could really go on and on, but I won't because we want you to talk. Um, I'm just going to add another one, which is I really um, see you as a talent agent. You really are spotting talent giving brilliant young people the tools and most importantly, the space uh, to do what they must to shape the realities um, and lead the world. So, so thank you for that. Um, you've also resisted labels, I think, because you fundamentally, as evident in your writings and some of the important theories you're going to talk about and practices you're going to talk to us about today, you really reject the concept of zero-sum thinking, of false binaries that's so prevalent, um, at least in our country today, and I suspect um, in Israel and around the world as well, um, especially as we're kind of surrounded with tweets and polarization and political ideologies, you argue that that binary thinking is really an enemy and that um, a quest for the perfect shouldn't stand in the way of progress. So there's a lot to talk about. We want to get started. I'm just going to read a short bio 
Um, and it's just, it's a very short one. So Dr. Micha Goodman is a leading voice on Judaism, Zionism, and the challenges and opportunities facing Israel and contemporary world Jewry. Jewry. Micha's circle of influencers extends to political and national leaders, academics, and the street. <laughs> he is the author of five bestsellers, including Catch 67. I think you have, I should have brought my copy in. Do you have it in front of you? You can just hold it up. The Left, the Right, and the Legacy of the Six-Day War. <laughs> Thank you. And has another book. Mika has another book slated for publication, I think, at the end of the year. He's the founder, as I mentioned, of Beit Prat, Israel's leading pluralistic Zionist Beit Midrash for young adults. He is an international lecturer and a frequent contributor to publications such as The Atlantic, The New York Times, and many others. So thank you again, Mika, for joining us. Um, so I want to just sort of jump right into it. While your writings and your thinking on a new direction for the seemingly intractable Israeli-Palestinian conflict preceded the pandemic, your book preceded the pandemic, you've actually talk, said recently that you think we need to be thinking more like corona. <laughs> so tell us more about that. What does it mean like to think like the virus? And tell us a little bit more about your vision for shrinking the conflict. Thank you very much, Charlene. I'm jumping right in, if that's okay. Jumping right Please. in. So shrinking the conflict and thinking the way we think about Corona, about the virus, I think I started thinking this is highly influenced by um, a feminist thinker called Carol Gilligan, researcher, feminist, psychologist, where she, I don't know if she coined this term, but she uses this term in a very interesting way. She calls it practicing radical listening. Now think about the, these, this term, radical listening. It's an interesting, interesting term because usually when you think about the term radical, you imagine somebody shouting, yelling, preaching. What does it mean to practice radical listening? So Carol Gilligan, this is how she explains it. When people always hear something that is different than what they're used to hearing, an opinion that goes against everything they grew on, everything they're used to hearing. So usually people, usually I, we, usually the way we respond is we respond with anxiety. When we hear something different, a different worldview, a different idea, a different opinion, we respond with anxiety. Gilligan says, Radical listening is about responding with curiosity. What happens when we move from anxiety to curiosity? And this draws on an important American philosopher, uh, John Dewey, that says a similar, has a similar idea. He says that um, anxiety and curiosity are a reaction to the same thing, difference. When you hear someone saying something that's different than you're used to, you can respond with anxiety. Why? Because it's different. And you can respond with curiosity. Why? Because it's different. So trying to adopt a curious attitude inspired by John Dewey, by Carol Gilligan, and by the way, I think to its depth, this is Talmudic thinking. Responding with curiosity and not aggression to different worldviews, I tried to practice radical thinking, listening to the Israeli internal debate regarding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Now, this book, Cash 67, this is how I started thinking about it, is not about the conflict. It's about the internal Israeli debate about the conflict. Or as you could say, it's about the conflict about the conflict. And what I tried to do, I tried to listen very carefully, to I tried to listen radically to the right and to listen radically to the left. When I was listening to the right, trying to flesh out the right's best, most persuasive arguments, I tried to ask, why is the right right? And I was listening to the left, I tried to ask, why is the left right? So what happened to me, I started with listening to both sides, bringing them try to bring the best out of both, made a, try, a Talmudic move here. And that later on led me to some new thoughts about the conflict itself. So Charlene, here's what I propose. I wanna start with trying to listen radically to the Israeli right and left, see where that takes us. And then 
after maybe we have a better understanding of the internal Israeli debate about the conflict, maybe that will help us move into the conflict and introduce the concept of shrinking the conflict. Okay, how does that, is that a good deal? How does that sound? Perfect. Okay, Perfect. Go for it. All right, all right. Shall I start with the right? I'll start with, I'll, I'll start with the right, the Israeli right. I'll try to practice radical listening. The Israeli right and the Israeli left. Now, now, obviously, the Israeli right has a lot of philosophy, a lot of ideology, many arguments. I want to flesh out the argument which most Israelis find most persuasive, okay? That's the following argument. The Israeli right argues if Israel leaves the West Bank or Judea and Samaria, the way, the way they call it, if Israel leaves Judea and Samaria, it's putting its existence under threat. And here's why. I want to ask everyone that's here. I see, here there's, I see there's 74 participants. Thank you all for joining us. I want to ask all of you, I want to invite you to practice radical listening. I want to invite you, even if you're very left wing, to make room in your heart to be persuaded just for one minute from a right wing argument. By the way, then all the right wingers among you, I want to invite you afterwards to be persuaded just for one minute from a left wing argument so we can practice radical listening to both sides. I think this is to its depth. I think I can prove this Talmudic, Talmudic thinking. OK, so let's so so the, so one of the most interesting arguments of the right is, is the following. What happens when geography meets history? Let's start with Israeli geography, okay? So I'm sure all of you are acquainted with the Israeli map. I'm not gonna draw it on, on, a, on a whiteboard now. I think Charlene once saw me draw this map, right? In the YMCA, remember? So I'll, but just imagine the map of Israel within the green line, okay? The, Israel pre-1967, how does it look like? So up north in the Galilee, Israel is wide. I mean, wide. <laughs> Not American, uh, you know, wide in Israeli terms, wide, right? Uh, not California, Israel, okay? It's kind of wide up, up north, up in the Galilee. In the south, in the Negev, it's relatively wide. But within the green line, in the center of Israel is very narrow, like 10, 12 miles narrow. That's how narrow Israel is in the center and the shore in the Tel Aviv area, right? That's fact number one. Fact number two, where do most Israelis live? Well, the irony is that's where they live. Dafka, I don't know how to say that, Dafka in English. Dafka, where Israel is most narrow, that's where most Israelis live. 60% of Israelis, 70% of our economy, 70% of our culture is all concentrated where Israel is most narrow within the green line pre-1967. This is very much different than the vision of David Ben-Gurion. Ben-Gurion thought we should be spread out, the Negev, but we decided that's what he wants, but that's not, we wanted like claustrophobic, you know, to, to like, <laughs> to be very, very, and we had the highest concentration area of Jews in the world in that very narrow spot. So that's a geographic, Fact, this is not, this is just a fact. Now, I wanna move from geography to history, okay. And I wanna, I wanna um, notice two historic dates. One, 2005, and the second, 2011. Let's start with 2005. Summer of 2005, what happens? The disengagement from Gaza. Okay, so 2005, Israel leaves Gaza. When I say leaves, completely leaves in a sense. It left the Israeli intelligence, leaves Gaza. The Israeli military leaves Gaza. And um, I think, can't, excuse me for not remember, 14 or 15 settlements are uprooted. I think it's 14. Not that, not that it matters, but in my mind, it will no bother me. I think it was around 14 settlements uprooted from Gaza, 8,000 people. So Israel left, leaves, Israel left Gaza. And there's a long story here. I'll make it very short. A year and a half later, 2007, Hamas takes over Gaza. And now rockets are now launched from Gaza, from the places that we left. Our military is not there anymore. And on a day-to-day -day basis, including today, communities living around 10 miles from Gaza are terrorized. Uh, kites, balloons, Qassams, missiles, not many Israelis live there. But the ones that live there, their life is kind of miserable. Now, a rocket that falls in your community, even if it's just once a month, 
is tremendous psychological damage. Because because the thing is, even if it happened just once a month, you think it might happen every day, every moment. So it might be small physical damage, but limitless psychological damage. And that's not how you build a life in a community. And that's what happens to Israelis that live about roughly 60,000 of them, that's actually, actually it's not a small number, living roughly 10 miles from Gaza. Okay, now let's ask the following question. What would happen if Israel leaves Judea and Samaria or the West Bank? There is a chance that what happened in Gaza will happen in the West Bank. Hamas took over Gaza. Hamas, even today in the polls, are up in the West Bank. What happens if that happens? And I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's like a 5% chance it will happen. I would say it's a 70% chance it will happen, but even if it's a 20% chance it would happen, this is what we're risking. Judea and Samaria becomes Hamas land or becomes some kind of a different version of, fundament, of, of, of unstable territory. And this out, but and now all the Israelis are living in the perimeter, in the periphery of the West Bank. Their life will be similar to the life of Israelis that live next to Gaza. There's just one problem. 60,000 Israelis live next to Gaza. How many Israelis live within the range of 10, 15 miles of the West Bank? Almost all of them. So a repetition of 2005 and 2020, a repetition of what happened to the periphery of Gaza, to the periphery of the West Bank, that would put almost all Israelis, the center of our population, the center of our economy, the center of our culture under immediate threat. So when geography meets history, that's the conclusion. A withdrawal from the West Bank is dangerous. Now that's one argument. But here's another argument, which I find even more persuasive. This is an argument from 2011. What happens 2011? The Arab Spring begins. Now the Arab Spring is a word is a, you know, words we used in 2011 because we thought it will be like the spring of democracy. That's not what happened. And nation states started collapsing all over the Middle East and forces of chaos were unleashed, destabilizing many countries in the Middle East. Now, in 2016, Henry Kissinger, no less Henry Kissinger, was interviewed for the Atlantic magazine by uh, Jeffrey Goldberg. And Kissinger had this very interesting image. By the way, Kissinger, still alive, sharp, kicking. I have somebody that you met, uh, smoked him lately, yes. And, um, and he says, this is, this is how he said, he says, what happens ever since 2011 in the Middle East, it's a geopolitical earthquake. I think it's a powerful metaphor. Because in a regular earthquake, every building that's not very stable, if it's a powerful earthquake, all happened to it will collapse. So when there's a geopolitical earthquake, every country that's not very stable collapses. That's exactly what happened in the Middle East. Two revolutions in Egypt, Libya collapsed. And what's, may God help the Libyans. What's happening now in Libya is horrible. Yemen tore it into two. Iraq, chaos. Syria, God help the Syrians. They're in, I don't know how to say it, Gehenom. How do you say Gehenom? They're in hell. Hell. Syria. <laughs> Yeah, you know, right. And all these countries are collapsing. So, 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 and these nations, so, and these are countries that had serious political traditions. So Kissinger asks, is this the right timing to create a new nation state in the Middle East? And what happens? Because when stable countries that we thought were stable, like Libya, Syria, Iraq, Taiwan, collapsed, will a new Palestine survive the forces that Iraq, Syria didn't? What happens if the bet goes wrong? And in the new Palestine, the forces of chaos will destabilize Palestine? What will happen there in the West Bank and Judea and Samaria? We will have a dysfunctional country, a failed state, and that vacuum of sovereignty in the West Bank, who will enter the, uh, the vacuum of sovereignty? So Hamas is the obvious candidate. We could even think of, like as an Israeli intelligence officer told me, Hezbollah, proxies of Iran, ISIS, Qaeda. So I was once with an Israeli intelligence officer. He says, who do you think will enter? So I said, ISIS, Hezbollah, Hamas, 
Putin, you know, why not? And he said, Micha, imagine a cocktail of all those forces together entering the West Bank. A vacuum of sovereignty in the West Bank will be a magnet for the forces of chaos of the Middle East. Then we have a dysfunctioning chaotic area in the West Bank on the verge of Tel Aviv. I like this argument very much from an intellectual point of view. Because you see the Israeli, this is Kissinger's argument, but the Israeli rights off argument used to be that a strong Palestine will threaten Israel. The upgraded argument is not that a strong Palestine will threaten Israel, but that a weak Palestine will threaten Israel. A dysfunctioning, a, a, a not very sovereign state will threaten Israel. Now, I find this argument very persuasive. And this is what I tried to put forward. When geography meets the precedence of history, the unstable geography, where Israel is most narrow, that's where most Israelis live. And we have the precedent of 2005 and the precedent of 2011. And when those dates meet those, this data, that leads many of Israelis to have serious anxiety regarding withdrawal from the West Bank. And I would say most Israelis are persuaded from different versions of this argument. And I hope that if even some lefties, if you listen to this, you realize, well, there is a serious point here. It's a gamble, gambling on our national security to leave the West Bank. Okay, that was my attempt, Charlene, to practice radical listening and ask, what did the right understand? If it's okay, I want to change places and practice radical listening to the classic left-wing Israeli arguments, okay? So the left, the Israeli left has three powerful arguments. One is an ethical argument, the second is a diplomatic argument, and the third, which seems most pers very persuasive for most Israelis, it's the demographic argument. So let me just start very briefly with the ethical argument. It's a very important argument. In the West Bank, there's occupation. Now, I want to just be very accurate when I use the word occupation. I have a chapter about this in my book, and, and I, I got in trouble for you. I, I smart, it's, it's a very nuanced argument. It's the following. I'm not sure the land is occupied. I'm not talking from a legal point of view, I'm talking from an ethical point of view. I don't think the land is occupied, but the Palestinian people are occupied. What's occupation? Occupation is the following. It's when there's a military regime controlling civilian population. Again, I'll say it. Military regime controlling civilian population. Oh, there's one more um, element we have to add in. It's when there's a military regime controlling the civilian population and the military regime wasn't elected by the civilian population. I think that's a situation in the West Bank. Now, I wanna just so we can understand how this feels and how this sounds. What's the definition of dictatorship? I think we all know there are some dictators in the world, you know, some places in the world are marching to that direction. It's when there's one person imposing his or, or her will on a nation, right? The democracy is a nation governs itself. Dictatorship, it's one person controlling a nation. What's occupation? I think it's worse. Occupation is not when a person controls a nation, it's when a nation controls a nation. Here's my best attempt to define occupation. It's the collectivization of dictatorship. I hope this makes sense to you, the collectivization of, the, of, of dictatorship. It's not one person imposing his or her will on a nation, but it's a nation imposing their will on a nation. And what happens if that nation that's controlling a nation is a democratic nation, so that means that every citizen in that nation, yes, is a partner in the collective dictatorship. Now that's not ethical, it's definitely not Jewish. And the Torah, it says 36 times that we are commanded to have extreme sensitivity towards minorities. You're supposed to know intimately the soul of people that are oppressed, of people that are immigrants, of people that are foreign, because we ourselves were immigrants and foreign and gerim in the land of Egypt. That idea appears 36 times, not only not Jewish, it's not Zionism. This is an important point to make. Why is it not Zionism? You see, Zionism is founded not on one principle, but on two principles. One principle is the return of the Jewish people to its homeland. Of course, that's Zionism, but there's something else in Zionism. And that is the idea of self-determination, the idea, or in simpler language, the idea that every nation has the right to govern itself and not to be controlled by an empire or a different nation. 
That's why Woodrow Wilson joined World War I. His 14 principles were all about self-determination, liberation of nations from empires. Now that universal principle that every nation should be liberated and should govern itself, that's a universal principle and Zionism is a particular implementation of the universal principle, which takes me to the following conclusion. Zionism and occupation are contradiction in terms. I'll say that again. Zionism and occupation is, why? If you follow my thinking, so it's obvious, let's just say this out loud. If Zionism, one of its basic principles is liberation of a nation, it's based on the idea that every nation should be liberated. That's Zionism. Occupation is controlling another nation. That's why occupation is anti-Zionism, as opposed to many people who say that leaving the West Bank is like leaving Zionism. No, controlling the Palestinians is anti-Zionism. Okay, that's an ethical idea, which is, has like three parts to it. It's not Jewish, it's not moral, and it's not Zionism. Okay, now there is a diplomatic idea that the left has, which I wanna be honest, I don't think it's a persuasive, it's, it's not a very good argument today, so I'm gonna skip it, okay? Just so you know, the diplomatic argument is that if Israel continues, a military regime controlling civilian population in the West Bank will be isolated in the world. That used to be a very powerful argument of the left. It doesn't seem like, you know, when, you know, when we have now a peace agreement with, uh, with the Emirates and with, uh, you know, Modi and China and Japan and all over the world, it seems like under Netanyahu, that argument has weakened. It still has value. I know it still has value, but it has weakened. And I want to present only the strongest arguments. So I want to, in my book, it was stronger. Now it's weaker. I want to skip an argument because I want to present only the, the, the most persuasive arguments. Okay. So I went into the ethical argument. There is a diplomatic argument, which I think has weakened lately. It seems like Israel can control the West Bank and not be isolated in the world, at least for now. But then there is the demographic argument. Now, the demographic argument for most Israelis is the most persuasive argument. And you know different versions of it, let me just, in the West Bank, without Gaza, there's at least 2.5 million Palestinians. Now there's main demographers here and there's debate among demographers. But 2.5 is the average number, it's also the number of the Israeli military, it's a number that I trust. But some people say it's 1.9, some people say it's three, let's just 2.5. What happens? When 2.5 million Palestinians would join Israel and join 1.8 or close to 2 million Israeli Arabs. They're not a majority, but they're close to a majority. Now, how would this happen? How would this happen? Well, there is a um, very serious and interesting Palestinian pollster called Halil Shkaki. And you know Shkaki, uh, Charlene? You're, you're, yeah. Yeah, we've worked with him, actually. A bit with him. Jerusalem. Yeah. I had a conversation with him just um, two weeks ago on, on Zoom. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Perfect. <laughs> and, um, and he's noticed an interesting shift in Palestinian uh, worldview, where Palestinians used to, used to be either for Mukabama, which means just fighting Israel, or a two-state solution. And now there is a third paradigm, one-statist. That's an interesting paradigm. Two-state solution means, fighting for two-state solution means we're fighting to separate ourselves from the control of the Israelis. That's our fight, that's our battle. They have independence. We wanna be independent from Israel. One-state solution is reverse. We want not to be independent from Israel. We want to be a part of Israel. Now, for many years, Palestinians were against that because that would be like giving legitimacy to Israel and to Zionism. But more and more understand that if they vote for the Knesset, so that won't give legitimacy to Zionism. If they vote in big numbers, that could actually end Zionism. So there's a shift and now 30 to 35% are for one or for changing the battle, shifting the battle from two state to one state. But Shkaki notices that that shift is among young Palestinians. Now it's demography is a slippery business and demographers are not very good in projecting, but it's a serious projection if the majority of them are young. So the direction of history is towards, if we project forward into the future, the majority of Palestinians will be one status. And when they turn their battle around, how can we not give them the right to vote? 
How can we control the people and not give them the right to vote when they ask for it? Then Israel is in real trouble. If we don't give them the right to vote, we're not a democracy. If we do, we're probably not a Jewish democracy anymore because we'll probably turn from Israel's a Jewish nation state to a binational state, the end of Zionism, the end of the Jewish state. Now, this is very persuasive. I think it's persuasive. The moral argument is persuasive. The demographic argument is persuasive. But hey, I was also persuaded by the right-wing argument, right? Leaving the West Bank is dangerous. Now, this position now that I'm trying to describe that is born from listening with empathy to both sides sounds like this. Hey, if we leave the West Bank, we are risking our future. If we stay in the West Bank, we are risking our future. If we leave the West Bank, we're risking our national security. It's hard to rebuttal that after 2005, 2011. If we stay in the West Bank, we're risking our morality, our Zionism, our Judaism, and we're risking not our national security, but our national majority. <laughs> so what do you do? Now, people on the right, they're like, you know, uh, there is no real dem demographic argument. It's like global, it's not real. People on the left, uh, it's not real. But what happens if you listen to what's right and what's deep and what's serious on both sides? So what happens is something like this, we have to leave the West Bank but we can't leave the West Bank and you become very confused. I wanna share something with all of you. This confusion is a new Israeli phenomenon. Most Israelis, according to many polls, think that Israel has to leave the West Bank in order to save its majority and its soul. Most Israelis think we can't leave the West Bank because that'll be dangerous gamble on our security. Most Israelis believe both arguments. Most Israelis are confused. Now, this is the most interesting thing I have to share about Israelis, is that politically, Israelis are confused. Now, I know this is shocking because we're so used to thinking about Israelis with certainty, right? Because the taxi Israelis, drivers are so certain in particular. Right. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, because we are tough, we know, we were in the military, I know, trust me, you know, we radiate this toughness and certainty. There's a gap between Israeli body language and Israeli attitudes today. Israelis lost their certainty. This confusion is a catch. Right, this is, you know, right. Catch 22 was, remember Catch 22, Joseph Heller? A guy doesn't want to fly because he feels like um, he's losing his mind in World War II, flying too much, fighting too much. But that's good news. Because if you feel like you're losing your mind, you get not to fly anymore and to go home. Right, some of you read this book, right? So, um, but there's a catch. If you tell your commanders that you're losing your mind, they'll see a person with so much, you know, so reflective, so aware of himself, completely sane. You need to continue flying. So that's the catch. When there's a prop, now that, that's the catch, where the only way to stop flying is to do something that will guarantee that you'll continue flying. Now that absurd logical situation became a term, a, 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 an idea, right? When you're in a situation and there's a problem and the only, the only solution to the problem creates the same problem again, that's a catch of 22. Let's analyze from the point of view of most Israelis. Staying in the West Bank is a problem that threatens Israel. Thank God it's a solution to leave the West Bank. The problem is that will threaten Israel. That's a catch 22. Sorry, that's what I call a catch 67. Okay, so this was the first part of our lecture tonight, an attempt to verbalize, to capture a new Israeli attitude. The Israeli confusion, the Israeli perplexity, the Israeli catch. So I thought, Charlene, I thought that this was my job to write Catch 67, to explain to Israelis their own views, trying to heal polarization, trying to get left-wingers to understand right-wingers, right-wingers to understand left-wingers, to, to do radical listening, to replace anxiety with curiosity, to do all that thing. And then something interesting happened in my life. The book was, I, I don't want to like show off or anything, but it was just, People, like, like, I don't think there was a leader of an Israeli political party 
or a leader of like an espionage, like of a, uh, someone in the intelligence community or in the military that didn't read the book. And there were people in the Palestinian community that read the book and American dipl diplomats. So what I did was I decided that anyone that reads the book, like if it's the head of the Shin Bet, like the FBI or the head of a political party or something, I'm going to go meet him or her. And that's a fun thing when you write, because, you know, you know, if you're reading someone's book, um, and so I just heard, like, somebody told me, oh, I heard uh, the head of the uh, Israeli intelligence is reading your book. I sent him a note. Can I meet you? And I met with him because I guess when you meet someone's book, it's nice to meet him. So I, I spent a year meeting all these people within the, pal within the Palestinian community, within the Israeli military, within the Israeli intelligence, some Americans. And I started realizing that everyone I met had at least one or two good ideas. I start asking, okay, there's good ideas out there. Why aren't we implementing them? And here's something happened to me. I started moving, shifting my thinking from thinking about the Israeli debate about the conflict to thinking about the conflict itself. And this, Charlene, is where I started developing the shrinking the conflict concept. Let me try to explain this. So I'm hearing all these very good ideas. And all these ideas we can't implement. I was asking, why can't we implement it? And, this, and I saw this, an answer like this. Well, we can only implement this idea as a part of a two-state solution. And we're waiting for an opportunity to have a Palestinian partner. We can negotiate, reach a deal, have a two-state solution. We can do all this stuff. And I start asking, why do we have to have a two-state solution to do that? Meaning, if there are steps we can do without a two-state solution, let's just do them tomorrow morning. Because you see, if every step on the ground depends on peace, you know what that means? That peace that's not coming means no steps on the ground, which took me to the shocking conclusion that the waiting for peace, the idea of peace, is freezing the status quo. You see, we're so used to thinking that the myth of settlements freezes the status quo, and that's true, but there's not, not a surprise. The whole purpose of the settlement movement is to freeze the status quo. But what's shocking and interesting, it's not only the sacred myth of settlements, which I go into that myth in the my book, I won't go into it now, is freezing the status quo. That's the purpose of settlements. It's also the myth of peace is freezing the status quo. Because if any movement depends on peace, peace that's not coming means no movement. So start thinking, okay, how can we create movement without peace? And without replicating 2005, this engagement from Gaza, which was experienced by many of the Israelis as a bad move. So how does that look like? Well, I want you just to imagine um, um, the following. Imagine someone says, he or she has a solution. I always want to, 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 just to see how we think about problems usually. Imagine someone that says um, that he or she has a solution to crime. I don't know, some magical, whatever. We implement it in smart, sophisticated policy and no more crime. Then the other person says, you can't end crime. That's impossible. That's utopian crime. You can't do that. So let's not do anything about crime. <laughs> or another example, let's say someone says, car accidents are bad, we have to end car accidents and have a brilliant policy that will end car accidents. Then the other side says, well, you can't end car accidents, so let's not do anything about it. Now these are obvious false dichotomies, right? If you can't end crime, that doesn't mean you don't, you don't do anything about crime. If you can't end car accidents, that doesn't mean you don't do anything about car accidents. When it comes to the conflict, that's how we think. One side says, let's end the conflict. The other side says, we can't do that, so let's just not do anything. You see, for some reason, we don't use binary thinking in many problems. When it comes to politics, we're trapped in binary thinking. Either you end the conflict or there's nothing we can do. Well, let's think about this one step forward. When it comes to crime, usually we say we can't end crime, but we're not going to be passive about it. We try to take care of it. We try to think of sophisticated ways to shrink the amount of crime. When it comes to car accidents, we try to shrink the amount. Of, no one is trying to end car accidents. And no one says that if we can't end car accidents, we're just going to be passive and not do anything about it. We try to shrink car accidents. When it comes to the conflict, 
we have two options, either status quo or like utopia. Well, we can't, I think we can't end the conflict tomorrow. We can't, we probably can't end the conflict the next decade or maybe the next two decades. But does that mean that we're passive? Absolutely not. There is a lot we can do. And so my argument is what would happen if we take the way we think about many problems into politics, we would start thinking about shrinking the conflict. Which takes me to, what would that look like? What would shrinking the conflict look like? So shrinking the conflict is not like a deal at the White House with a handshake and a Nobel Prize. It's not like a deal that cures the Middle East and solves everything. Shrinking the conflict is something else. Shrinking the conflict looks like a sum of many small steps. Every small step is a small step. The sum of small steps is a big step. So how does a small step look like? A small step is a step that, on the one hand, shrinks occupation, and on the other hand, doesn't shrink security. Shrinks occupation means Israelis control Palestinian less without being threatened by Palestinians more. Now, all the ideas I heard throughout the past two years do exactly that. Shrinks occupation, doesn't shrink security. Let's just do that tomorrow morning. And every step, and I've, and thinking about this for a while, and, and, and Shalei knows, in Beit Prak, we actually put together a lot of young Israelis that try to take different ideas from different places, different people, different books, different plans, and put together a package of steps that shrinks dramatically occupation without shrinking security. Would that end the conflict? Absolutely not. Will it change its nature? Yes. So let's start doing that tomorrow morning. But to do that, we have to overcome two dreams, the dream of sacred land, right? Expansion of settlements. We have to give up that dream. And the dream that's peace is coming tomorrow morning. We have to save our bargaining chips for the great deal. If we overcome the two utopian dreams, we could actually minimize real suffering on the ground. So that's, the, that's how, Charlene, how I moved from listening to, trying to figure out, to verbalize the Israeli attitude towards the conflict. That was my first step. The step was trying to break binary thinking regarding the conflict and try to give birth to a new way, a new attitude, a new approach to the conflict. That's how the shrinking the conflict concept was born. Now, from my experience, um, what I said now is never enough because people need me. Like, okay, what will those steps look like? So, Charlie, maybe I'll just give like two examples of the steps and then. Yeah, we have a few questions coming in. This is great. I also just want to be sure that you also, maybe in the steps, talk about creating the generation that creates the peace because there are questions coming in about, well, what's the end goal? So, anyway, that would be great. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, whole generation. Okay. Yeah. Tell me. Um, the situation on the West Bank looks like this. Imagine you're planning to move into a very nice big house. And you say you're moving in five years, in five years. So the temporary house you're gonna live in, you, you're, you're willing to compromise, not the amazing house, and not a nice apartment, you know, no elevator, whatever, you're willing to live there because it's temporary. And then what happens is you realize that the temporary conditions you only agreed to because they're temporary became permanent. That's what happened to the Palestinians. In Oslo, um, they were told or they understood that in five years, there's a long term, there is a permanent solution, which will include an independent Palestinian state. In the meantime, there is a, there is a very, very imperfect autonomy. And what happened is they agreed to that impermanent solution and it became permanent and they're stuck in an impossible situation You're trying to explain the situation. Um, and to make it easy, it's just like this. The Palestinians have autonomy, meaning they're governing their own lives on roughly 40% of the West Bank. Now it's complicated because part is area A, part is area B. I'm not gonna make a distinction now, just to make things easier to explain. But roughly, <laughs> roughly, we're talking about 40% of the West Bank. The problem is that those 40% where the Palestinians are governing their lives, they're not contiguous. So let's say this is a Palestinian autonomous island. Over here is a Palestinian autonomous island. And the area in between is area C. It's controlled by the IDF, by Israeli military. 
Now we're talking about over 160, I think it's 169 Palestinian autonomous islands not connected to each other. You know what that means? It means that when you're Palestinian living in Ramallah, when you're in Ramallah, so you're like, hey, I'm a Palestinian governed by Palestinians, not experiencing occupation, kind of nice. Your cousin in Nablus also is a Palestinian governed by Palestinians when he's in Nablus because it's, it's an island. The problem is those autonomous islands are not connected to each other. So you want to go visit your cousin from the Ramallah to Nablus. You have to go through Area C, then three things could happen to you. One, you can't predict what will happen on the road. You might be stopped, might not be stopped. But even if you're not stopped, you, can't, you couldn't predict it. Two, when you're stopped, you feel humiliated. And three, you feel discrimination because settlers on the same road are not stopped. So discrimination, humiliation, in a world where you can't predict, that's occupation. And it's a result of the fact that the Palestinian autonomies are not connected to each other. So how about we connect them? And here's an idea. This is not my idea. It exists. Imagine a territorial corridor of a few miles that becomes that becomes Palestinian sovereign. It becomes area A. So a Palestinian sovereign territorial corridor that connects these islands to each other. And in the center of that corridor, there would be a road. So you know what that means? You're driving the road, you're Palestinian, driving the road. Maybe you look to your right, that's area C out there. It's controlled by the IDF. You look to the left, hey, that's area C out there. But the road itself is area A, it's pal the cops that will give you a report of Palestinian cops. So you move in a sovereign corridor that, con that connect all the Palestinian islands to each other. Now, let's do this, this, and I wanna say something. This corridor would reduce occupation dramatically. It won't reduce security at all. I know, because I checked this, I spoke to all the security, it won't reduce. Why do we have to wait for peace to do this? You see, if we're waiting for peace to do this, peace is not coming, we're never gonna do this. Let's just do this tomorrow morning. And reduce occupation. I think occupation now is to the level of 80, and we take it down to 40. Here's another step. You know that the Palestinians not, not only don't have freedom of movement, it's very hard for them to fly out of the West Bank. And this is pre-corona, now nobody can fly anywhere. But pre-corona, their only way to fly is to go through the Allenby Bridge, cross that's the Jordan River, go to Allenby, go to Amman and fly from there. It takes Palestinian average 24 hours to cross the Allenby Bridge from different reasons of bureaucracy, of technology, of, of, of its dysfunctioning aboard it. It could take 40 minutes. We have to reform the Allenby Bridge. We should share sovereignty with Palestinians. There's a lot we can do. Let's not wait for peace to do that. Let's do that tomorrow morning. If we do these two steps, just these two steps, connect the islands to each other and connect the Palestinians to the world. So what happens is there's freedom of movement within the West Bank and they can move out of the West Bank. And a big chunk of the experience of occupation is out of the way without making peace, without waiting for the Messiah without risking security. Why can't we do this tomorrow morning? Now there's more steps. I gave you two examples. There's more steps. Here's how I imagine it. Israelis are enjoying, let's say, I'm making up a number now, 80 points of security. Palestinians are suffering 80 points of suffering, of, of occupation. If we can reduce occupation from 80 to let's say 15 or 10, and Israeli security will stay 80, maybe go down to 75, maybe even go up to 85. Is that a good deal? That breaks a zero some game, that reduces occupation dramatically, it doesn't reduce security, that's what I call shrinking the conflict. And the good news is we could be active now, we could be proactive. It's not Zionism to wait for the Messiah. It's not Zionism to wait for historic conditions to transform the Middle East. Let's do this tomorrow morning. Now, to Charlene, to your, to Charlene, to your question, what would happen what would happen, I realize I have to, I have to uh, uh, what would happen if this could be a part of a deal, not a peace deal, not a peace treaty, but a different kind of a deal. One of the reasons why a deal between Israelis and Palestinians doesn't seem possible is because Israelis, there's a lot of research about this. There's also an emotional clash. You see, many Israelis do not hate Palestinians. They're just afraid of them. They're afraid of them. This is just being very honest very afraid of them. And like when they see Palestinians, they feel a little bit anxious. It's just a fact. Many Palestinians don't hate Israelis, but they feel humiliated by them. 
And even if Israeli is not trying to patronize, that's how they feel. Now, what happens when Palestinians feel humiliation, Israelis feel anxiety? And I think they both feel the same, like maybe, maybe for good reasons, maybe for bad reasons, it doesn't matter. That's the situation. I, you don't need to have research to know this, but there's a lot of research that backs this. So what happens, um, how does this play out? Because Israelis are afraid of Palestinians, so we overcheck them, right? In airports and check folks, we overcheck them. As a result, we humiliate them. Because of humiliation, that creates a poisonous atmosphere that sometimes leads to violence that makes Israelis be afraid of them more. And therefore, more security, more humiliation, and you see how we spiral here. Yes, humiliation creates an atmosphere that creates you know, violence, that creates more anxiety, leads to more humiliation. What's true on the local basis is true also on a macro base. Think about it. Israelis probably would never agree to create a Palestinian state where our air force can't fly over Palestine, where we can't don't control. Can you imagine something more humiliating for Palestinians having the Israeli air force over their head? So the only deal that will satisfy our anxiety will create humiliation. Or we want our forces on the Jordan Valley. Is that what's more humiliating for Palestinians than foreign troops of their enemy or, or used to be their enemy in their territory? So any deal that will satisfy our anxiety will create humiliation and any idea that will give Palestinian dignity will create Israeli anxiety. So there is an emotional aspect here, which is not, not talked about enough. So what happens? So, so maybe you should think of it this way. How do we calm Palestinian humiliation and Israeli anxiety? So here's my last take on this. And then I'm moving the ball back to you, Charlene. We can't bring peace in this generation, but that doesn't mean we can't move forward. Shrinking the conflict would mean trying to create a generation of Palestinians that were not humiliated by Israelis. And a generation of Israelis that were not afraid of Palestinians. If we could create that generation, that generation could create peace. Let me make this clear. Our generation can't make peace, but maybe we could create the generation that could bring peace. We can't create a deal now, but maybe we could create the psychological conditions that could lead to a deal. So, and this is thinking biblically. When Israel, in the Bible, when the Israelites left Egypt, they didn't enter the promised land immediately. There was a 40 year gap between slavery and redemption. 40 year gap. And according to one of the interpreters, Rabbi Avraham ibn Ezra, the purpose of that was to train their minds, a new mindset that will enable them to enter the land of Israel. It seems like we need to create a gap of a generation between us and peace. And that generation, a generation that doesn't, of Palestinians that are not humiliated and Israelis that are not terrified, that generation could create peace. Maybe all we can do is create the generation that could create peace. So I went through a lot for analyzing the internal Israeli debate, Israeli confusion, false dichotomy, shrinking the conflict through small steps we could do tomorrow morning. What will those steps do? It will shrink the conflict, reduce suffering, and it might do something else. It might create a generation that could create, that could bring peace. So that was my- Thank you. Wow. That was a lot, but it was really um, incredible and compelling and as evidenced by all the questions that are rolling in. So we're going to push a little, a few minutes past, if it's okay with you, Micha, 9 p.m. your time to just get to a few questions. Um, I. A couple of the questions have been um, around the what is the end goal? What is, so I think you kind of addressed it. You know, what will the 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 goal is to create the generation that will create peace. It's not it's foregoing a goal of peace in order to shrink the conflict to create that generation. So that's really important. A couple questions are coming in around leadership, um, leadership on the ground on both sides. Are they willing? How motivated do they need to be? Um, young. Palestinians and Israelis, how, were, how did they feel about the shrinking the conflict? I know you're kind of working on both those fronts. I know that some of these are very sensitive um, current conversations. So maybe just if you could comment on both the willingness of leadership, political leadership, but also grassroots, the grassroots that will inherit, that will be that next generation. 
Great. So I think among Israeli leaders, I know personally that there are some Israeli political leaders that are fascinated by these ideas and are some that are not crazy about these ideas, but maybe current political leaders are less interesting. What's more interesting is what's happening grassroots on the ground. And I can tell you that Israeli grassroots on the ground, many Israelis are very excited about this. And I, so, and now my Beit Prat activists are a sample, they're not unique, they're a sample of the best of Israel. And you know, you know these chevra, right, Charlie? So I think what characterizes the way these young Israelis are thinking is like this. On the one hand, they're very idealistic. And on the other hand, they're very flexible in their thinking. And that's a rare combination. Because many times when people are very idealistic, they're not flexible in their thinking. Or when they're flexible about their thinking, they just don't care and they're, and they're indifferent. <laughs> That combination of being very idealistic and very flex in their passion and very flexible in their thinking, that's a growing Israeli current. And that's where these kind of ideas are gaining a lot of traction. And I think that's the future of Israel. Passionate idealists in their soul and very pragmatic and flexible in their thought. And I think that's a growing Israeli current and exciting Israeli current. And... Um, and I just, I don't want to, you know, Charlene, I don't want to, um, I don't want to overstate the influence of these ideas, but just like, let's say one testimony was that my book, 2000, uh, uh, Cast 67, I'm only saying this just to make the point is, um, was Israel's most read nonfiction in 2018? So that says something about this kind of thinking, right? You know, so that says something. And um, there is a uh, Israeli reporter called Daphna Liel. She has a podcast and she did a podcast about this idea. And it was out of her um, 73 podcast. It was her number one most listened. Con so I'm saying there is Israelis, I think, are hungry for this kind of an idea. And I ask about Palestinians. Well, I think the Palestinians are facing a catch 67 of their own. Maybe we better call it a catch 48. According to many polls, according to many conversations with Israeli intelligence and many Palestinians, so they were always faced with two paradigms, Hamas and Fatah. Hamas was about Mukawama, like a fight, and Fatah was like two-state solution and everything. They look at Gaza, they see Hamas paradigm doesn't work. They look at Ramallah, they feel like Fatah paradigm doesn't work. Just like Israelis are confused, young Palestinians are confused. Our biggest question, is how do we channel confusion to action? So what I'm trying to do in Israel is to channel confusion to pragmatism, confusion to action. I think the potential within the Palestinian society is there's new confusion now. And the question is, will that confusion lead to despair or to new ideas and new action? That's the big question. I don't know the answer to that question, but that's where the potential is. I'll just add anecdotally, and I know you have some experience um, with with some Palestinian um, groups of young people. We focus our work in Jerusalem, and one of the things we found is that Jerusalem is about the most pragmatic city there is when it comes to the young people. So like East Jerusalemites, for example, Palestinian East Jerusalemites, who maybe are against ideologically normalization, young people, they are very pragmatic though about improving the conditions of their communities that really came out in corona so the the from from what you're saying i can just really affirm that in jerusalem not everybody but there is a group that maybe wouldn't even identify that are still very um strong in their identities they're zionist or they're israeli or they're they're Palestinian, they're Muslim, whatever, but they're pragmatists and they understand that they need to also move forward, that action is going to speak more. And so that is the core that I think you are working with. And that is definitely being borne out in the people, the young people on the ground. When you really listen with empathy to them, it's much less the slogans and it's much more, well, what about the school that I'm going to drop my kid off tomorrow? We're so used to think that when people are pragmatic and they're thinking, there are probably no parv in their, in their identity, and it's wrong. The East Jerusalemites are pragmatic in their thinking, and they're very patriotic in their identity, if it's Palestinian or Israeli. And that's a very important, promising combination. Absolutely, yeah. I think that, that and it's a, it's a coalition of right-wing and left-wing, um, and I don't think we've ever articulated it like this, but listening to you 
it's because there is empathy, like both sides kind of come to the same conclusion or a similar conclusion, regardless of the way that they are thinking, but all their interests are sort of um, captured. And so I am, um, I'm reading through the questions as well as some questions that there seem, I mean, there are questions around addressing some of the current events. I don't know to the extent that you want to do that. Um, I will just throw a few of the current circumstances, you know them, and you can just say how this is borne out. Um, the coalition government, the government, the, na the nature of internal politics in Israel, the clear um, gap in Palestinian leadership at the top. I mean, with Abbas getting older and an uncertain how um, COVID, of course, and annexation um, has come up in the questions and also impact of that on your ideas and then um, the UAE deal and kind of how that affects. So I'm just sort of so throwing that stew of problems that is like from the last month, maybe, into how you see your practical work on the ground being affected by any or all of those factors. Yes. So um, I think Israel is different than the U.S. in the following sense. American society is very polarized in the politics. I guess it's a gross reflection of polarization. Like the, 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 the division in politics is a reflection of a division in the country. I think in Israel it's different. The country is not very divided, but the politicians are very divisive. So Israel is different. In Israel, the, the political polarization doesn't reflect a polarized society. It actually masks the fact that we're not so polarized. <laughs> okay, we're not. So, so, um, so I think the future of Israel is more a grassroots bottom up than the politicians or the current leaders of Israel. But let's just imagine the future. I think it's fair to say that we're towards the end of of the days of Netanyahu. Now, God knows so many people said that line for so many years and they were always wrong. But it's fair to say Netanyahu has been governing Israel for many, many years. It won't last forever. It's also fair to say that, the la that these are the last days of Abbas. Now, people have been saying that for a while. But here's something for sure. Palestinians have a hard time imagining their political landscape after a bus. They can't imagine how they would look like. They don't even know what the process is of electing the next one around. Israelis have a very hard time imagining how Israeli politics will look like after Netanyahu. So here's something for certain. Netanyahu and Abbas are in their last days, months, or years. And what's after both of them is complete mystery, completely unknown. That means there is, that's, it's unknown, that creates a lot of anxiety, but also a lot of potential. Um, now towards uh, um, uh, the, um, the UAE deal. So I just wanna make, uh, offer one thought. Here's a very sophisticated move and a very impressive move, canceling annexation towards peace with the Emirates. Very nice. Actually, it's a nice, it's actually a very elegant move because like um, Israel gave up something that I'm not sure it wanted to do anyway for peace, great deal, kola kavod, great. There's only one problem. We can't sell that good, those goods twice. We can't cancel an exation that you canceled again, right? We can't do that again. So we have to offer something to Palestinians in order to promote more peace with, God, with, with Arab countries. And what would that be? What would that be? What's the next thing we can offer? We can't offer canceling annexation again. What's the next thing we should offer? I think this is how it looks like. Let's start speaking about, about dramatic expansion of Palestinian governance, autonomy, shrinking occupation, towards continuing peace, the movement towards peace in the Middle East. I think that's how it could look like. That's why I think, Charlie, we might have a renaissance for this kind of thinking. Well, that addresses a lot that there's a bright, a bright horizon. Um, maybe if we do the right, if we do right by the, by this generation. So I want to, we need to wrap up. And I really just in that vein, I just think it's important like to sort of switch gears. We've been talking a lot about politics and some practical steps. You, you're doing something really amazing this week, right? Or this month with the generation that you're talking about and just, um, 
just for a minute, I know uh, we're a little bit over time and we'll wrap up in a few minutes, but I think it's really important for you to tell our friends um, of what you're doing in the forest of Jerusalem uh, at Beit Prat this week, uh, this month. Really crazy. Um, every summer we have like a summer camp, but it's not summer camp for 14 year olds. It's summer. It's not really, it's like, a, it's like, um, a bait, an all immersive bait midrash experience for 24, 25, 26, 27 year old Israelis. Those Israelis, me and Charlie were talking about very passionate and very pragmatic, very idealistic, or very flexible. That rare combination comes to bait Prat for this summer. Now we were afraid that this summer no one will come. Why? Because the conditions are, if you come, you can't leave because of COVID. You're in groups of 26, you can't leave them. All these crazy conditions. And under these conditions, we didn't have, we don't, we're not having our smallest program, we're having our largest program ever because Israelis are starving. Let me just say something about these Israelis. It's a rare combination, not only of idealism and pragmatism. We're talking about moderate centrist Israelis that are passionate. And I think that's kind of what we're missing in the world. A passionate center. Passion always is attached to extremists. But most people are centrist, moderate, flexible, pluralistic. But they're less passionate and more indifferent. Can we create a passionate center? So that's what's happening right now as we're talking in the forest of Jerusalem. And that's, I think, a potential for Israel in the future. It's pretty cool. We're going to include, if you give us permission, a picture that you sent from the forest uh, in our follow up email, because it's really fun to see. And we'll also include there's a lot of questions about your book. We'll include a link for the book, a link for the lecture. Um, If we could when we when we do this in person, we'll even give everybody a book. But uh, that day we'll have to wait a little bit. And it's just we're so grateful for you for joining us. We'll also send a few links to articles that Micha has written in The Atlantic and The New York Times about some of these ideas. And I don't think you've heard the last of these ideas. There's things that are being actively worked on right now, which is very exciting. Yes. Yeah. So thank you. Um, And thank you also to your wonderful colleague, Ayelet at Beit Prat. She has been instrumental in helping us with with everything, really. And um, it's just such an honor to work with you. And I'm so happy for this opportunity to introduce you to to, to some of our friends and to really spread this vision of passionate moderacy and centrism. It's just a vision that I think we can all cling to. Uh, Jenny, I'm just going to ask you, is there any more? Do you need to make any announcements? Yep, we'll be following up, like you said, Charlene, with an email with all the things that I promised you uh, shortly. Thank you so much. Laila Tov, Micha, we couldn't thank you more. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining. Bye. Wonderful morning, afternoon, evening.